when I when I first encountered the uh, the uh, the uh, the train of thought, um, my my initial sort of like knee jerk reaction against it, well, it wasn't a, a a reaction against it. It was a sort of a uh, transformative uh, view uh, with my own life and the world that I've been brought into that, you know, I felt angry that I'd been brought into a world that had been allowed to get as bad as it was. And but not only that, uh, on on the flip side, it was also mixed with a feeling of um, elation that uh, that there is a potential solution to to make things better. And as I think that was probably how I felt for the first, well, probably the first nine months to a year of be of being an activist, that uh, that I you know that I was fueled by this anger, but uh, but that that you know that slowly dissipated and and I actually grew to grew to actually be appreciative that I've that I've been born into this period of history right now. I mean there was a uh, I mean I was listening to a um to a Joe Rogan experience podcast uh, one of the uh, one of the recent ones where they're talking to Duncan Trussell and um and Duncan uh he he states a um I mean, I don't know whether this is an actual theory that uh, that people have now, but he 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 made the claim that uh, there are there's a theory going around with new age people that uh, that there are that there are souls that have chosen to be born now just so they can uh, they can be able to to have been witness to this very interesting point in history, and you know it, even though you know. <clears throat> when you think about it, it, you know, it's quite ridiculous, but it is an interesting thing that, you know, that the period of history that we're living in right now is so, so interesting and so different to any other point in history. So why should we feel angry about being brought into this? Because, you know, it, it's, it's a bit like what George Carlin says is that uh, when you're born into this, uh, when he's, especially when he's, because he's talking about the United States, he said, "When you're born into this country, you're given a front row ticket, um, front row ticket to the freak show." <laughs> mm-hmm. so, I mean, would uh, would would you say you uh, you'd agree with uh, with that summation? That I spoke because because obviously, you know, I um, I can't speak from experience, like living in uh, living in the United Kingdom. But would you say that living in the United States, it's uh, that's an, an accurate summation? I think that the United States is essentially the the point of the spear, so to speak, when it comes to the direction that the world is moving. Um, I do think that the United States is definitely an excellent example of what not to do, but um, <laughs> I actually spent some time in Ireland, and uh, oh, one of the... One of the bed and breakfasts that I stayed at was run by a teacher, a history teacher more specifically, and we had a long conversation about um, what she saw going on in Ireland. And one of the things was is that, well, it seems that uh, Ireland is not content to simply allow the United States to make mistakes, that we insist on making every single one of those mistakes <laughs> ourselves <laughs> – you know, before we're willing to acknowledge that they're mistakes. Um, she talked about the, the fact that all of her students are just saturated with media. You know, the they're endlessly playing handheld video games, you know, the iPods, the, the cell phones. And, you know, they're, they're so tuned into that and they're not tuned into the world. You have to remember that, you know, people like you and me use the Internet as a tool of enlightenment. Most mm. people use it as a tool to numb themselves to the things that are actually bothering them. You know, that's that's when these things can become destructive. And I think she was absolutely right. There's kind of a feeling also that it reminds me of like uh like when you're raising teenagers that they insist on making all those same mistakes that you made, you know, and they're not willing to listen to you because you did have some fun along the way. And that's what they're hoping to get. They don't realize the long-term consequences. And I think that uh, overall, like, for example, um, I had a friend who lives in China, 
And I asked him, you know, what does he think as far as like the, you know, is there any kind of communistic ideology in China, like for the country that claims to be a communist country? And he's like, no, actually, the exact opposite is true. I'm watching as people in China are becoming incredibly materialistic, that they're becoming incredibly consumeristic because they're following in the footsteps of the other country that was the huge manufacturing giant that made a bunch of money making all the stuff, which is what China is doing now. And mm-hmm. so they're passing into their renaissance of you know what comes from that in the positive, and then eventually they will in turn deal with all of the negatives that go along with it. You know, he said that you know Chinese women are becoming more uh, materialistic about who they choose to marry. Um, you know that the they're the overall the the culture in general is seeking. You know, they've all got to own cars, even though there's no practical you know application for owning motor vehicles in most of China. Um, you know, they've all got to, you know, have like super nice stuff because they have been caught up in the social stratification system. And I say, yeah, America is certainly part of the problem. But, you know, from what I gathered from this conversation with this lady from Ireland, that the United Kingdom is not really that far away from that. Um, <laughs> yeah, not far you know, away at all. <laughs> that um, other countries that the more modern they become, the more, you know, the more you know, benefits that come, but also the same kind of decadence. Essentially, Rome, rather than crashing at this point, is spreading like a disease. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of disease that, you know, I mean, think about it. Okay, we've already seen that statistically the, the planet cannot handle everybody here living the way the United States does. It can't. Definitely not. But do you think that the other countries that are coming into the, to their wealth are going to go, oh, well, we're not going to try to live like you. You know, they're not going to say that. They're going to be like, no, it's our turn. We want to do this, too. You guys did it for the last 200 years. We mm-hmm. want to do it, too. You know, and then the planet dies at that point. That's why when people discuss, you know, like capitalism systems versus uh, resource based economies or versus centrally planned systems like, you know, communism – they, they always want to ask you, what are you going to do? Are you going to force us to be part of your, you know, <laughs> intelligently managed system? I'm like, no, we don't have to do that. Well, what do you mean? I'm like, you know, because you would have to force me. I'm like, no, you don't get it. Yeah. End game here is an uninhabitable planet that kills all of us. We're not going to show up at your door and force you to do anything. We don't advocate violence. We also don't think it's effective. But – when the planet is uninhabitable, we all die. The situation, the circumstances will force people to change. Yeah, it, absolutely. I mean, I've, there's, you know, there's, there's that sort of mind lock um, in so many different facets of our, you know, of our uh, cultural nuances and. And our, um, you know, the, our methods and, and our values. I mean, that, I mean, the one, one, one of them in particular, one, you know, one that it's probably the, one of the most emotionally charged issues. And I relish the, uh, the thought of diving headlong into it. And that is the, uh, the issue of, um, of people who molest children. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, and one of the one of the things that that I I you know that I like to interact with people about is that what method of behavior modification is effective, you know um what what is the best way to go about truly solving this problem, and because it's such a such an emotionally charged issue, a lot of people say oh well you know. Bring back hanging, bring back the guillotine, or throw, um, lock them up, throw away the key, sort of thing. And, and they're so emotionally charged. And I try, I try and engage them on a level, and I say, look, that kind, that kind of, that kind of, you know, method uh, we've been using for thousands upon thousands of years. Um, it clearly hasn't worked. Um, so. What we need to do is we need to figure out what can actually stop this once and for all. And if you think about it, if you're, if you're diagnosed with a brain tumor, uh, but your main symptom is 
the headaches, are you going to are you going to cure yourself of a brain tumor by prescribing paracetamol? No, you're not. You need to actually, you know, find out. Uh, you know, you need to get a biopsy. You need to find out whether the uh, whether the tumor is benign or malignant. You have to find out whether it can be operated on. If it can, then you need that tumor removed. So therefore, in order to get down to the very bottom of well, in order to truly solve such an emotionally charged issue such as paedophilia, we need to get down to the brass tax fair. We need to find out what causes that behavior and thus be able to truly, you know, eradicate the the instances of that happening. But the thing is that that advocation of total solution to it that gets lost because so many people are so emotionally charged because you know because it's you know it is one of those really visceral issues i mean surely yourself being a father you you can understand how you know because i mean myself i'm i'm not a father so i can't really you know uh speak with complete um with complete empathy about this but obviously you 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 know you're um you're in that position where you where you can completely understand that well, you know emotional yeah and i mean let me not only am i a father but uh, that's happened to my daughter before um, oh, really? at the hand yes, at the hands of uh the man that my ex-wife was with and so yeah i do understand but at the same token you know <laughs> the funny thing is is that although you know i never encountered the individual after it happened which is probably better for me um, <laughs> it doesn't change the fact that it, I still recognize through the entire thing that the individual was someone who probably should not have been around children in the first place. And I shared that same uh, feeling with my ex-wife, who, of course, didn't listen. But, you know, when I met the guy, he looked like the main character of American History X. He had, like, hate tattoos on him. <laughs> he, you know, he had a, a long criminal record of, of things like... Uh, cocaine possession, heroin possession, larceny, uh, robbery. I mean, he was not a good person, you know. Bad age. Um, so, well, right. And so, and it's not this, and once again, product of his environment. But, there, you know, when you look at the issue of child molestation, you also have to look at the cultural points behind it. Because when you consider this, um, for example, 13-year-old girls used to be considered of sexual, you know, maturity. And they would get mm. married. And I'm not advocating that that's what should happen, but I'm pointing out that our perception of this issue has changed. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm pointing out that it's important to understand you know, the, the various issues that go along with this and consider for a moment that culturally we are now in a world where what was once considered to be a viable sexual age is not anymore. Most of that is also, mind you, due to necessity, because in the earlier ages, people lived less time. So as a result, you know, there was less time after a woman, you know, had her first period um, to start having children, you know, and many children that you had were going to die. So culturally, that's what evolved out of that. Um, the most, almost all of the indications say that sexual molestation uh, is like a plague essentially that reproduces itself, as in you get it because someone else gave it to you. You know, somebody did it to you. Um, it doesn't happen spontaneously. That's another thing that I think people need to understand because, you know, that's why like, people are like, oh, well, well, human nature says that there are just bad people. You know, that there are child molesters and, and, and murderers and all of that. And I'm like, okay, so what you're telling me is, is that child molestation and murder is part of human nature. If that's the case, then why are we not all out there molesting children and murdering people? Exactly. Exactly. You know, um, and that's a really irresponsible way to look at it. It essentially allows us to go, oh, well, that's human nature. Allows us to not really take responsibility. You know, just like Gabor Mate said in Zeitgeist Moving Forward. You know, the genetic argument essentially allows us to. Uh, you know, it's a cop out. It allows us to yeah. you know, refer to the state of things without actually taking responsibility for our part in those state of in the state of things. You know, that's a paraphrase, but you get the point. It's essentially, um, you know, uh, just like anything else. Is it an emotionally charged issue? Absolutely, it's an emotionally charged issue because people shouldn't rape kids. 
but our system that we have right now for for dealing with the problem isn't working you know and that's it's interesting 